Well, tonight we're talking about the, the I'll say, the premier class, the beginning class, the starting class, the foundation, which is really about developing that most important survival tool, which is you. You are the thing that makes all the difference in the world. You know, as we talk about self-reliance, and that's the thing that's always on my mind and in my discussions, it, you're either going to be making these provisions for the future or you'd be a victim. And as always, you and I have a choice that so we have to simply want. It is really about living providently, but in order to do that so that we can be self-reliant, it has to be based upon principles. And that's part of what I'll be presenting tonight very briefly and very quickly. Uh, so what is the determining factor for survival? Well, we actually kind of identify that. So when things get extremely difficult, even desperate, uh, extraordinarily hard, the thing that will make all the difference in the world is you. You will be the one that determines whether you make it. Now, that's both through things that you do now, but it'll also be what's in your head and in your heart and your commitment when the time comes. And that's part of what I want to help you understand what things are. So how do you prepare for such a time when it might be extraordinarily difficult? Well, it comes down to this. Uh, I just simply ask the question uh, about this, how would you even decide if you want to make it no matter what? Uh, you know, there's, there's a price to be paid. So will you be ready to face the future? It comes down to learning the process and living the process that it will take to do this. And it comes right down to choosing to pay the price that it takes in order to make it through these extraordinarily difficult times. And you will make the choice is what it comes down to. Uh, you have to make that choice. So if you don't make the choice, you simply become a victim. And one of the things I like people to understand is that when it gets really tough, victims don't survive unless somebody is there to take care of them. Uh, so, you know, my thought is you really don't want to be a victim. You know, being a victim is, I've tried that. You know, I've been a victim a few times in my life, and it was pretty pathetic, as a matter of fact, so I don't want to go there. Those of you that have been here before, and I know folks in our audience here have seen these things many times, so you can mouth them along with me very quickly, but the truth about life is this, there is no doubt that tomorrow will come, and there's no dispute that things happen. But how you're prepared to meet tomorrow will make all the difference in the world if you're prepared for the worst then no matter what happens it will be an adventure and I simply believe that it would be better to have an adventure. well the question I ask very often is this will you live providently as always you have that choice and it is by making these provisions for the future in all of the areas of your life that you would be able to face the future with hope and with confidence rather than fear and trepidation, rather than worry, rather, rather than wonder about whether you make it. So how do, we, how do we do this? How do we come up with a process? One of the things that may be important to describe is uh, what is it that keeps people from being ready to make it no matter what? What are the things that get in the way? Well, I have my preferred list of these things. <clears throat> Number one, it's apathy. This is pretty high on the list. It's like well, I'm just too busy, it's not that important, or I just don't care, I'm not worried. Whatever the reason is, that's kind of at the top. We have a lot of people that think in terms of lists. In other words, if, if people have decided, well, I know I need to get ready and do some things, uh, so just give me the list, I'll go buy the stuff, and then I'll have to worry about it. Just give me the stuff, and I will do that. And as I point out again and again, first off, I don't do lists, and secondly, the lists will get you into trouble. It's not the answer. So a list mentality is a problem. We also have the vacation mentality, which simply says, you know, we're, we're focused on, and by the way, I'm not against vacations. I love vacations. I'd like to take one someday is what it comes down to. Uh, you get a few of those every now and then. They're wonderful. But sometimes people are over-focused on the next, the next play thing, the next trip, the next outing, and those things. Uh, and if it's just for the purpose of play, now, by the way, you can take a vacation and go live on a ridge in the middle of winter without fire shelter to me. Now, that's a vacation, but it also serves another purpose. Uh, so being focused on always having that play might to get in the way. We have the entitlement mentality, which is probably one of the biggest ones of all. It goes along with apathy because there's a system out here, whatever agency it is, whether it's family or it's church or it's community or it happens to be government agency or something like that. And besides that, there's these rescue people that'll come along when things get 
and I'm entitled to their help because I've been paying my taxes and giving my donations. We have a dependency mentality that goes right along with it, which is, look, I, I expect these people to show up. I know that they always do, don't they? We hear about the Red Cross and, and, and FEMA and the National Guard and all these people that come along and many relief agencies, hundreds of them around the world. So they're going to show up and take care of me, and I just know that they will, and I'm counting on that. We have another one that's kind of the big one. It goes along with some of these things up above. It's the American dream mentality. The American dream mentality is more and bigger is always better. And so it's an accumulation of some of the wealth that we have. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with wealth uh, whatsoever. But if that becomes the focus over being prepared to meet the future, then that could be a problem. And then we have the mental image of things always being as they have been. I mean, in this country, for really for all of my life, uh, and I was born right at the end of World War II, and for all of my life, I've lived in the most prosperous country in the world and have enjoyed great freedoms and what have you. Therefore, since it's been all of my life like that, I can expect that it will always be like that, right? Why wouldn't it be like that? And so we have this image of this is the way it always has been and the way that it always will be. Well, I call this my tree of death. Uh, and uh, that will get you into big trouble. Now, by the way, and, and I, I try to be careful about not picking on anybody about things, and I'm not into gloom and doom, but we need to be pretty bottom line. We need to be very basic in wanting to know what could happen, am I ready, what is the reality of these things. Now, a statement that I have made regularly, and it usually catches a lot of people off guard, and that is this kind of a thing, that the people of Haiti, and we recognize that tremendous incident uh, here, now we're coming up on two years ago, very soon, when this terrific earthquake came along and did so much destruction to them. But the people of Haiti were better prepared to deal with that than our people uh, are to deal with those things. You say, how can that be? Well, consider this. Should the U.S. have a Haiti level of event, something that does as much damage to the economy, to the infrastructure, to the populace, that death and disease will be worse for us than it has been for them. And that seems like almost a startling statement to make. After all, we're the richest country in the world and we give aid to everybody else. How could we find ourselves in trouble like that? I hope shortly you will understand why this is true. And it's not so much for physical reasons as it is for things other than that. Now, if you look at this whole topic wrong, and this is where I want to be very, very careful because sometimes people look at these things Others that I do, we talk about some pretty gnarly subjects. Those of you that may have been here a while back when I did EMP and CME, and we will do that again and get it uh, captured and make it available, and I'll finish that series. You know, we talk about some really ugly topics, and sometimes, uh, you know, if you look at these things and just focus on the terrible things that can occur, some people say, oh, I, I don't even want to try and live. Father, they quit before they get started. I hope you will not do that. You see, true preparedness is based upon understanding principles of how and why things work. It's not just a list of things to buy and own and store away. And I'm certainly not against having things that we set aside. But what it comes down to is this very simple concept, that what you know is far more important than what you have. And that's not to say don't have things, but that's to say you've got to get these things order. And that's part of what this beginning area and the foundation area is about, is helping you to understand what these priorities are. Now, we're going to look at a very compact overview of the classes where I spent a lot more time in these critical principles, and so we're going to touch on them extremely briefly in this uh, foundation area. <clears throat> and in the other classes, we sometimes give a little bit of review of these things for just a moment. But here we're going to take a little more time to focus on them. And in the rest of some of these uh, uh, 1,000 series classes, we dig into them quite deeply. And what we're talking about is having an organized structure. It's how you can focus on things, how you can get an order and efficiency to them. So with your efforts, you can get things done that you need to do. It's really it's wrap your head around all of the things that you need to learn, do, and have. And that's kind of the category of things, learn, do, and have. Because what it comes down to is you want to maximize the use of your money, save your time. We want to be as effective and efficient as we possibly can. Because for most of us, both time, 
money and other resources are somewhat limited. And if you spend them out of order, let me give you an example of that here briefly. Uh, some people will go out and buy a generator before they take care of things like mm, water uh, or food because they want to have electricity because they believe they need to have electricity. Electricity is a vital thing to have if you have a pressing need. Let's say somebody is living on a respirator at home, you need electricity. But for most of us that don't use a respirator or something like that to sustain life, electricity is a nicety, not a necessity. And so you want to take care of other things that would get you in trouble first. So it is about getting the right order to these things, and that's where understanding how and why things work is so important. Well, the foundational law for all of these things I call the law of stewardship. This isn't just for the preparedness, but this is in all the things that we're doing in life, and it's a very simple concept in that there are three parts to it, the first of them being authority. Authority is a very simple thing to understand. You happen to be alive. Since you're alive, you have the ability to act. That means you have the authority to act. It's been granted to you by whatever source you would like to believe, but you have been given that. And so now you have the responsibility to act and act properly, which is number two in this area of the law of stewardship. And each one of us, by the fact that we're alive, has accepted a certain level of responsibility, whether we want to think about it or not. And it's up to us to act properly, correctly, and in a way that will get the results that's important, that's proper in life, because number three in this list of stewardship is the accountability. And accountability simply means that you and I will get the results of whatever our actions are. Things we do or do not do, we'll be held accountable for them. Some of them will be fun, enjoyable, something that we like doing or having fun of being a part of this, uh, uh, whether it is an event that we're involved in in life. Or if we make mistakes in these areas, do it wrong, it can be very unpleasant, very frightening, uh, grinding, unpleasant, dangerous, even deadly. So a simple idea, the law of stewardship. And in this area of provident living, of uh, preparedness, of survival, whatever label you'd like to put on it, the law of stewardship simply says we have the right to act because we're alive. We must act and we'll be held accountable for whatever we do. Foundational law, simple one. Another foundational law is this. It's the law of provident living. In fact, I believe it's kind of the umbrella to everything we talk about. It has four parts to it, order, priority. In this order, at the top, I like to use the key word spiritual because there's more to you than meets the eye more depth of character, of capacity, of energy, possibility, future, hope, all of these things. That's a part of who you are. And you must nurture that above everything else. Number two is the one that will make all the difference between whether you live or die when things get really tough, and that's attitude. Attitude is the thing that will get you through when things are extraordinarily difficult. How do you have an attitude that says, I can make it no matter what? I don't care what is going on, I am okay. As a matter of fact, I believe that we should find ourselves being it doesn't mean we have to like things, it doesn't mean they're easy or simple, but it simply means if we understand who we are, where we came from, then we can be filled with I will take it on and I will love it no matter what. So how do you develop an attitude like that that says so long as I'm, I'm sucking air, I'm okay and I feel good about it? Well, it's really number three on this list, which is knowledge, which is going to help you do that. Now, by the way, perhaps let me define something for Real quickly, which is about attitude. Uh, no, I'm going to save that for later. Come to think of it. We'll just touch on these things briefly here because we're going to dig in. Knowledge. Knowledge is the one that will determine really what your attitude is going to be. And it's actually number one, which is about spiritual, and then knowledge of other things coupled together will help you have an attitude that says, no, I'm okay, no matter what. No matter what goes on in my life. And then at the bottom of this list, we have stuff. Now, it's not at the bottom because it's unimportant. It's at the bottom because the other three things need to come first. If you focus on the material things and you don't have the right attitude or know how to use your stuff or whatever it is, your stuff may do you no good. As a matter of fact, if you want a demonstration of that, take a look around and you'll see that they're away all the time and they're surrounded with a lot of not necessarily in a deprivation of physical things, but it's in the other areas, the spiritual, the attitude, and the knowledge that they're suffering. So they opt out of life sometimes completely. The law of the parachute is another one of these that's important to understand. There's really kind of five parts to uh, a parachute concept here. I think we all have a picture of what a, a parachute is. 
You have to have it before you need it. You have to have it on when you need it. You have to know how to use it. You have to actually use it. And it better will be of life-saving quality because if you can't answer yes to all five of those and you jump out of a plane, you're dead because you can't fix the problem. Well, the law of parachute, that concept, works perfectly well when we're talking about provident living or preparedness or self-reliant living, uh, whatever you want to call it, or being in a situation where you need to survive. But in this case, we're talking about being properly prepared with our attitudes, our knowledge, our skills, the supplies and material things that we have. You see, the disaster or whatever has occurred doesn't care. It has no responsibility for your well-being whatsoever. See, that responsibility is yours. It's just like gravity doesn't care if you have a parachute on or not. It makes no difference to gravity. It's going to simply do its job. Disasters and emergencies and life when it comes at us, those simply just roll along and it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves with our attitudes, our knowledge, our skills, and our supplies. As we're looking at this idea of provident living, uh, there are nine areas that I talk about. I very often talk about them as being modules because they are kind of a module. Everything within them is grouped together and works together, but they don't stand totally independent because take a look at that list. Foundation, which is principles or clothing, water, sanitation, nutrition, shelter, wellness, tools, supplies. Take one of those things and say for the rest of my life I'm going to cross it off and never have anything to do with water. <clears throat> Most of us know we won't live very long. Uh, or nutrition, or sanitation, or shelter. You can't remove any one of those items from the list and say, I will never have those things again. Now, some of them will get you in trouble very quickly when you don't have them, like water. You know, within a few hours, you start to suffer. Within two, three, four days, you're dead. It doesn't take very long. Others might take longer, like nutrition, like food. Most people can go without eating for two, three, maybe four weeks before they would finally expire. Now, it won't be a lot of fun as you get beyond the second or third week, but yet you don't die until you're out there a little way. So some of them will go quickly. Others, it will take longer for them to affect you, but eventually every single one of them will. Well, in these nine key preparedness areas, and in this particular class, since this is uh, the 1000 series, and this is all about the foundation, which is all about principles, and there's a whole bunch of classes in this area, this is what we're talking about. And as I mentioned, we will be going through the series series of each one of these modules, both for the, uh, the, the, the umbrella class, if you will, the 1000 series, and then we'll be adding in others underneath that. All right. True preparedness is based on principles. I've already said that several times, but I want you to understand within each one of these, these nine areas, they have their own set of principles that deals with them. Now we're going to be talking primarily about this number one, which is foundation principles, but each one of them, water clothing, nutrition, sanitation, they have principles in them. And what I do my best to do is, is when I'm talking in each one of these areas, I want to teach you why I tell you the things that I tell you, not just do this because I say so. What I say so doesn't count. What counts is that you understand the purpose, the reason, the function for these things. So what I'm saying is it's not about memorizing everything that's in with each one of these areas, because you probably can't. But if you understand the principles that are associated with it, those things you can remember, and then you can get things functioning properly within them. And the other thing is you're able to extrapolate information. Situations where I haven't quite been here before. I don't understand. I haven't done this before. But I've done things kind of like it. I understand how and why things work. Let me look around, and you'll find that you start understanding what to do, even though you don't have firsthand experience with it right now. So don't memorize things. Just understand them. We're going to take a closer look at this law of provident living because it's really the foundation. It forms the underpinning for everything that we talk about. If you'll remember, the four parts of this is, number one is spiritual. Now, in the law of provident living and spiritual, I want to make a point that I'm not here to teach you doctrine. I'm not here to talk uh, denominationally or anything like that, but I simply want to identify and help you understand what a critical thing this is. Because if you skip this area, as far as I'm concerned, nothing else really matters. This is the most important one of all. That's why it's at the top of the list. And when all else fails, make this point. We don't like to think about this, but when everything has gone wrong that can go wrong and it keeps going wrong, and things are truly deteriorating terribly, there may be nothing to fall back but upon that which is inside of you, who you really are and where you came from. And that's what I define as being part of the spiritual. 
Now, as I said, I'm not here to teach you things in this area doctrinally, but I'll identify my roots and my value system, and you need to identify whatever yours is and then nurture it and take care of it. As for myself, I'm a Christian. That is how I was raised, and that's where I've come to study and have spent a lot of time in this area, and it is a central focus of my life. Uh, the scriptures, and this happens to be turned to one of my favorite ones that some people say, can you find anything about preparedness in the Bible? It's full of it. This one, which is 1 Timothy 5.8, says this, But if any provide not for his own, and especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Uh, and it doesn't say just when life is good and easy and you have a job and everything's working that that's when you take care of your family. It means that we make preparations to take care of them should something go wrong, should things not be working as well. And that's why we save money and that's why we set aside supplies and that's why we learn new skills and abilities in all of these areas. Another thing that I would like to point out, and particularly for me in this country, is that I believe in the godly foundation, the heritage of this country. If you're not familiar with this uh, video, I would encourage you to get it, America's Godly Heritage by David Bart Barton. You can look it up online and get it. To me, it's very important. It was very enlightening, uh, and it was extremely helpful in understanding perhaps some of the things today and what is happening. But I believe in the Christian foundation of this country. And that doesn't take away from anybody else's beliefs. System, Please have your own uh, and uh, be very true to those things and study and learn and be sure that you have a foundation that will support you. And this is what I believe else. In the law of provident living, number two on this list is attitude. You know, it's this, uh, this thing that I tell you will determine whether you live or die when things get really, really tough. Well, let's understand what I mean by attitude. And it used to take me a long time to define this. But I'd like you to consider this definition. And it is simply this. It is how you emotionally respond or react. Now, please understand there's a huge difference between responding and reacting to something. Reacting is very much like, you know, the rubber hammer on the knee that they whack that and your leg kicks up. You know, it's just, a, it's just an immediate reaction to something. Uh, and th there's a big difference between reacting and re responding. And the key word is that you want to learn to respond to things. But here's the definition, how you emotionally respond or react to what is going on around you especially when things are completely out of your control. That is the best definition of, in terms of what is attitude? How does your attitude look? Where does it, where, have you ever seen anybody you've been around, you can see their attitude? It's like splattering all over the place, you know, and it's splashing on people, and some of it can be pretty caustic. You want to have an attitude when things get really, really tough. And it's not about being stoically tough and gritting your teeth and being tough and macho. It's literally about having something that wells up inside of you that emanates peace. By the way, that's difficult to do. And by the way, I'm not there 100% of the time. I get into situations right now where I find myself not being as calm as I would like to be, and I have to kind of grab myself, if you will, by the collar and maintain that calm. So I'm still working on this. But have you ever been around somebody that no matter what seems peace? I believe the foundation for that is number one on this list, which happens to be spiritual. That is the ultimate foundation to be at peace, and in particular, Christians, about what will keep you at peace. So developing this attitude is extremely important. When things go really, really bad, I mean really bad, uh, if you don't have a firm spiritual foundation and if you lose your attitude in life around you, very simply, you die. And I don't mean to be melodramatic, it just happens to be a fact. And as a matter of fact, you can read about that, and I've read this hundreds of places, in, in books, and in articles, and talk to people that have been around people who haven't made it, because they didn't have a firm foundation, and they lost their attitude, and they simply curled up and went away. Or they did something that caused them to lose their life. So it's extremely important that you have that firm spiritual foundation that you can lean upon and that you have an attitude. Now, when I talk about attitudes, let me give it to you in this way and help you understand some of these components that might be part of your attitudes. As a matter of fact, 
I believe that you should develop and live each day by these key personal B attitudes. And I chose that word for a very specific reason when we talk about the B attitudes. And so here they are. This is what you're wanting to have be a part of your life. Number one is purpose. And this is at the top of the list. As a matter of fact, when we talk about some of the books and other things I'll be looking at in a few moments, you'll see this is always at the top of the list for people that survive. What we're talking about is a reason, a need. When things get really, really bad, if you have no purpose, why would you keep going and suffer? Why would you keep up the effort? So you must have a reason, you must have a need, you must have a purpose. Secondly is passion. You see, you can have a, a purpose, a need, a reason for something. But if you don't have passion for it, you do not have commitment. Passion is something that's kind of burns inside you. You feel it. Now, very often we may have some of that passion. We think of it in this world as passion for somebody else who becomes our spouse, our partner, passion for our children. We think about it in relationships with people. But it can be other things in life that we have a passion and a commitment for. One of the biggest challenges is keeping this in balance because there's many things that we this strong affinity for and feeling for, but it's keeping it in balance and in the right order, the right priority. So purpose and passion. Here again, when you study the lives of people who have gone through the impossible, you'll find that they had purpose, they had passion. Next on this list is integrity. Now, what, how integrity fits into this is a very simple, simple concept. It is this. It's really about humility. It's about recognizing that uh, we don't know everything. We can't do everything. We're open for change. We're open to learn. We're open to go into a situation and say, gee, I thought I knew what I was doing. Now. Or as a matter of fact, I don't know what to do. I need some help. I need some guidance. We may, in fact, draw on a higher power for that and or we might be willing to just sit down and look around. Okay, let me calm down here for a minute and let me see what I can learn and what I might be able to learn from other people that are around me and with me. The other thing you have to have is humility. Of course, this goes along with it. Humility is what's going to lead us to knowledge. Integrity and humility are first cousins. They're joined at the hip. But humility is what will ultimately lead us to gaining new knowledge, new understanding. Then we have courage. Now, if you'll look above right here, you see courage is not about being fearless. When we look at people and say, boy, they were certainly uh, courageous, and if you talk to them in some kind of a rescue situation, whatever they were doing, they were scared out of their minds. They may have been terrified, but what it was is they had purpose, they had passion, they had humility, they had commitment, and they were willing to do whatever it took anyway. And so from courage, we find that it leads us right back to our purpose. Courage comes from our purpose. They go hand in hand. If you have no purpose and no passion, you will have no courage, is what it comes to. Whim that comes around you. Discipline is next on this list. What is discipline about? Well, discipline is about work ethic. And again, this ties back into commitment. If you have a commitment and you have a purpose and a passion, you're going to be disciplined to do what you have to do. It'll also bring you to a point of patience. And patience is strict, is very, very important to lead you to your outcome because very often some of the things that we're dealing with in life, whether it's an emergency or whether it's just life, because life is interesting at times, you have to have patience to go all the way to the conclusion and to see things through. But you can see why the items above this are critically important to be there because if you don't have purpose or passion, why the heck would you bother patience until you get to the outcome? These go hand in hand. The bottom one right here is not at the bottom because it's unimportant. It's actually at the bottom because it can be the foundation for everything else. And that's an odd concept, it seems like, which is when I say forgiveness, what do I mean? You find yourself in a very, very tough situation. Something's happened. Somebody did something that maybe got you into this situation. If you spend all of your time being angry and blaming them, you may not survive. You have to move beyond the events. You have to forgive. And what this comes down to, the key word, is love. And it's about loving your purpose, your passion, your reason, the commitment, the integrity, all of these things. It's the ability to let go, to, if you will, forget things, to forgive things and not be ground up in them. And one of the things that destroys an awful lot of people in survival situations is 
they're not willing to let go. In other words, they're not willing to forgive those who got them into this situation. Well, there was a pilot of the plane that made a mistake and crashed it in the mountains. You can spend all your time blaming that pilot and what he did, and while you're blaming him, you're dying. Forget it. Forgive them. Let go. <coughs> it is about being able to move on. I hope you start to see why that's the list of the personal Beatitudes. Well, developing them to their fullest potential is what is so critically important for each one of us. Part of the way that you do this, oh, one last little thought right here is that you're going to live these things. You make them a part of your life. You practice them daily, minute by minute, until they literally become your attribute. Rather than having to remember to have purpose or passion or integrity or humility, courage or discipline, you live them so much, so continuously, that they, that's who you literally become. That would be the goal, to live these things until they become your attribute. I heard a, an individual put it this way, and that was discipline yourself to do good until your disposition is to be good. We discipline ourselves to do these things, all of these things. We, we make a choice. We determine that we want to do them until it just becomes who we are. And that's the way that it should be. All right, how do you do this? Well, part of the way that you do this is you study materials by other people. You obtain and study an attitude library. I'll touch on that a little bit more as we have. The Law of Provident Living, and by the way, we go through the library and I will teach you the things, at least that I believe that you should read, you should have, things you should We do that in other classes. There's not time to do that here. So I'll skip over some of these things and just realize they are in the other foundation classes that are part of this series. The Law of Provident Living, number three, is knowledge. So we look at this list, spiritual, attitude, and then knowledge. It's vitally important that you understand what knowledge is. You see, knowledge is not just having information on a subject. Very often it says that, you know, books are a source of knowledge. Books are not a source of knowledge. There is no knowledge in any book. So let's understand what knowledge is by definition. Okay. Knowledge is information multiplied by experience. Hence, we can have this simple little formula that I put up all the time, K equals I times E. You see, books are full of information, but there's no knowledge in there. It becomes knowledge when you take it, when you play with it, when you use it. And what happens is, when you gain experience with something, it becomes a part of you. Now, this is a general formula. This is a, a very general thing for life. You can have bad information, and you can get bad information and get the wrong experience with it and have something that will get you in big trouble. Uh, it may, in fact, be something that you happen to believe is correct, but it ends up killing you. I'm going to do a class here in the not-too-distant future. It's titled loosely something like this. Uh, if you do that, that's going to kill you. I don't care what that show-off expert says. There are some reality TV shows out there that are some of the most dangerous things I've ever seen. They're absolutely appalling in some of the things they show you, and a couple of them are billed as though these are the things you want to know so you can survive when it gets tough. And they're absolutely uh, a disaster. So that's where you can have information by somebody that can pull it off, but if you try to use those things in some of these emergency situations, they can get you in trouble. I'll point that out when we do those classes. When we're looking in this area of provident living and knowledge, I break it into kind of three categories. Uh, and this has to do with how you learn things. Uh, they are number one, strategy, then there's education, and finally there's instruction. So let me define them to you this way, strategy. Strategy is the big picture. It's when you grasp what the reality is about the, the, the big view of things. It's the 50,000 foot view. If you've ever been flying in an airplane and you've been in, you know, 36,000 feet or what have you and look down, you can't see many of the details, but you can get the lay of the land. And it is the big picture. It's the 50,000 foot view. Then you develop a realistic plan to deal with these issues that you're looking at. And we're talking in this case about provident living or disasters or emergencies. And you, what you have is an outcome in mind. The outcome might be pretty simple. I simply want to live. Well, actually, I like to live and not suffer. Actually, I'd like to live, not suffer, and have a pretty good time. You see, you can start laying out what you want your outcome to be, 
in these things. But you have to know what the big picture is and what it is that you're facing in a very large context. Well, you obtain and study a strategy library. Here again, as we have time, I'll go into these in depth, but there are books and videos and things you can watch that'll help give you a big picture of possibilities of things. Next is education. So let's define education. Education is where you have the big picture in mind, but now you're gonna get a little closer to the subject. It's kind of the 10,000 foot view. Details are coming into focus. As you develop the overall understanding of all of the, these interrelated, it's like the skills and tools and supplies, the commitment that, that you have to have inside of you and around you to get your outcomes. So you're getting a little closer to these details. So here again, you obtain and study an education library. A lot of these may be in the forms of books, they may be videos, they may be classes and things like that. There's a lot of things that I teach that fall into both the area of attitude and they come into the area of strategy and then of course education. And then we have instruction and instruction is this, it's still with this big picture in mind and, and the commitment uh, and this closer look at things and the outcome that you want, but now you're gonna be in the dirt. This is not the thousand foot view, this is on the ground with your hands on the dirt beller, basically. And it's where you develop and practice the details of the skills. You don't just read it, you know, okay, someday we may not have the access to food, so I should learn how to garden, so I, I get that strategy. I read a garden book, but I never garden. Okay, you've got some information, but you don't have the skill. You need to get out there and get your hands in the dirt and plant and harvest and make mistakes and have plants die. Uh, so that you learn from them. So it is these skills, it's the processes, it's the means, the materials, the tools, the methods, supplies, and everything that you need to have. And you have experience with them. So at this point, we're now really gaining knowledge. Uh, our education and instruction is leading us to knowledge about these things. So here again, you have study and you use an instruction library. And this may be books and videos and classes and hands-on kinds of things. I like to go to as many lectures and presentations. I read everything I possibly have time to read, and then I go play with them. Well, more principles about provident living. Some of these concepts I'd like you to understand that fit into this. <clears throat> One of them is this. It's kind of a definition of what is self-reliance. I like to use the word self -reliance. As a matter of fact, we talk about this uh, Tuesday radio program that, that I do each night over the internet, what the self-reliant living show. And it is about learning to be self-reliant, not self-sufficient, because to me there's a big difference between trying to say I'm self-sufficient, because frankly, I don't think any of us can be self-sufficient ourselves. But we can be self-reliant where we're reliant on ourselves and other people around us. So self-reliance is a process. It is not a destination. I don't believe you ever arrive at a place and say, I'm perfectly self-reliant. I am now self-sufficient, you see. We will never be there as far as I'm concerned. So it's a process, it's not a definition. It is an attitude more than an ownership of a bunch of stuff. If you just have ownership of things, you're not going to be self-reliant. Now you should have some things. It'll certainly make it easier, but you have to understand that it's an attitude rather than just stuff. It is about having a positive outlook. It's not about being negative and fearful. It's not about being ground up in all the awful things that can, might, do happen, because that will paralyze you. That will keep you from being able to go forward. Self-reliance is about being focused on the future. It's about having a future. You see, I believe in the future. I want a future. I have a future. I'm not tied into gloom and doom and things, and I look at some pretty gnarly things and go like, oh my heck, I, gee, I hope that doesn't happen could happen, so now I'm gonna deal with it. And what happens is, when you become focused on the future, all the possibilities, you're not looking at it in a negative way, and you're out to sell, solve the issues, now then you can have an attitude that says, you know what, I'll take the future, whatever it may bring, and I'll do my best to be ready for that. It is about being helpful to others. It is not about living in isolation and simply saying, look, I don't care of me and my own, and you know, it's your problem, whatever you do about it your household, your family, and your friends. And I believe that anything less than having these attitudes, beliefs, the way you look at things, is simply choosing to become a victim. Because you have to have all of these in place to be self-reliant. Now then, attitudes about the future. And I would ask the question, say, well, uh, so what's yours going to be? 
when we take a look at the future. And there's different ways that people look at it, how they describe it. And there might be a little bit of each one of these in all of us to some degree. Uh, but you don't want to have too much of most of these in here. There's one that's the pacifist attitude. Well, I'm just not going to worry about it, you know, and it, it may be because of entitlement or it may be because you believe nothing will happen or it may be just simply because, well, I just don't believe in being, you know, confrontational or anything, so uh, walk all over me, it's no big deal. Um, then there's the opposite of that, which is the Ramboist, and that's where, like, you know, shoot everybody that comes onto your front lawn, you know, and when the bodies get piled up there high enough, they're going to leave you alone. And there's a lot of people that have the Rambo attitude. We might also describe some of these people as being alone. And what happens is these are the first ones that don't make it. <clears throat> they die on for a variety of reasons. We'll look at that in some of our other classes. Uh, there's a survivalist attitude, and this is the guy that's, you know, he can eat raw snakes and he'll bite pumping chicken hearts, you know, out of the chicken while it's still alive and let the blood run down his chin. And or these tough mountain man survival guys or whatever it is. By the way, there's nothing wrong with learning some of these skills and the ability to take care of yourself, but some people focus on that, you know, and I'm the tough guy and I'm the mountain man to do these things. Uh, there's also the, uh, the isolationist, which is, you know, I'm just going to take care of me and my own and you take care of yours. We ain't talking to each other right here now. You just go away and alone. I have my business, you have your business. There's a lot of people that look at that because, you know, I, I can't take care of you, so I'm not even going to try. You go away. We have the ignoringist, which is where an awful lot of people fall. And that is they just look around and say, well, there's nothing really, not going to happen, not here, not this country, not this happy valley, not to me. It's never happened here. Why would it? Whatever it is, you know, so they just ignore things around them uh, for whatever reason they want to believe. Then we have the majority of people that have a lot of these other things in them, and that's the entitled masses, because there's a system that owes me. I've made my contributions to society, to organizations, and therefore when it gets tough, to be taken care of. Well, take a look at that list and see where you fall. Or there might be another attitude that you want to have and it's part of your preparation. And that is to be a self-reliant family that is interdependent. As a matter of fact, in the future, one of our classes will be on developing and building a community. How to find one, and or if you can't find one to join up with, how do you create one? Because frankly, you can't do these things alone when it gets really bad. Anybody that thinks they can is totally, absolutely wrong, and you've been watching too much Hollywood stuff. You need to share your learning with others so that you can become this self-reliant family, and you're interdependent within other families that can share. We need each other now, we need each other in the future is what it comes to. So the questions that I ask again and again, and this is part of this setting the stage for future classes is, uh, you know, is, is this just a bunch of negative gloom and doom when we talk about these catastrophes and disasters and EMP and famine and disease and pestilence and what have you? Is this a bunch of gloom and doom talk? Or is this really what provident living is all about? Being prepared to meet the future, whatever it may bring. Uh, and the thing that I would ask you is this, if you have any one of these other attitudes or to yourself or somebody else, and you say, well, that just can't happen, N not, not to this country, richest country in the world. We're not it couldn't happen here. We've been feeding the world for generations. Why would that happen to us? Well, can you afford to be wrong? That's the question you have to ask. And what I believe is this, you put yourself in a position where you do all of these provisions and planning and training and learning and stuff like that, and then frankly, you hope you are wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Because you can afford to be wrong, but if you're somebody who says, well, that can't happen, that, that just never happened, or it's, it's only a 10% chance, that's not worth preparing for, you can't, you can't be wrong. Because if you're wrong, you're dead. Simple as that. And you're gonna be suffering, and your family's gonna be suffering with you on the way to dying. So you want to put yourself in a position where you can afford to be wrong. Another thought, how you feel about your future is in your hands. We've already talked about these things, but this is our synopsis to help you kind of boil this down and say, well, what is my attitude? Since the choice is yours, you're either going to choose to live providently, or you will have chosen by default to become a victim. Very simple idea. Another question is this, well, will you live providently? The choice is yours. 
And it's by making these provisions in all of these areas of your life, all these nine modules and the, and the, the understanding of how and why things work, who you are, what you stand for, and in all the physical needs that you have and making provisions in all of those areas, so literally you can face the future with hope, with confidence, rather than fear and trepidation and worry and concern and, and misery in the back of your mind all the time. You see, as I said early on, true preparedness is based on understanding principles. It's not a list of things that you buy, a bunch of things that you have, that you store them away, that you hide them away, whether it's in the trunk of your car or the basement. Because what you know is far more important than what you have. And you have to have these things in the correct order and the relationships with each one of them. This truth about life that I stated earlier, that there's no doubt that tomorrow will come. Life happens. Be ready for it. If you're ready for it, then you're not just going to be bowled over when things come and smack you upside of the head because some of them will. So since life happens, how will you handle it would be the question. Uh, you must learn to properly respond rather than react because re reaction will get you in trouble. Now, sometimes the response might come very quick. And it, reaction does, and response, uh, when we say response, it doesn't mean, well, let me sit down and think about this for a while. As a matter of fact, I'll write and make a list and some notes on it. Look, when the car stalls on the train track, there's a whistle, a horn, and a light, you know, get out of the car. Now, you don't have to sit there and ponder this one very long. The car's not going to start and it's stuck there. Then you can respond very quickly to it. Somebody who reacts may, in fact, become so frightened about what's happening that they freeze and they never get out of the car and they get killed. So you properly respond, which is abandon the darn car, get out of the way. It's very simple. Okay. The time to learn is now. Now is when we learn them, when life is, is easy. The time to practice all these things is now. So my question is, a big question is simply this. And you say, why should I do that? Well, life's pretty good right now. Well, if you cannot do these things, if you cannot properly respond, if you cannot have an attitude of being filled with joy, uh, if you're unable to do these things when life is so easy right now, how's it going to be when things are really, really bad? As I said earlier, when things get really, really bad, loss of attitude will kill you faster than anything else. Now, this brings us to answering that question. I posed, I made a statement, kind of a question, kind of a statement. I said that the country of Haiti was better prepared to deal with what occurred to them than we would be should we have that same level of event. The bottom line is it's about attitude, about outlook. It's about what you've been dealing with and what you're prepared to do. Those people, as terrible as that was, and as much as they suffered, and they did suffer, in those things, and some of them still are suffering, and they will be suffering for years. We'll talk more about Haiti because we can learn a lot from what happened. And I will tell you that those people were better prepared in their attitude to deal with what happened than we are. And it's a very simple concept. The people of Haiti, it's a very poor country. It's one of the poorer countries in the world, and they had a lot of difficulties and troubles there. And those people for generations have been living in that very limited lifestyle and a very difficult lifestyle at times. And they were living in it and they were dealing with it. When that earthquake came and it destroyed so much around them, how far did they have to fall? They were just about a ground zero anyway. They fell, it hurt. Where do we live compared to them? We live in the stratosphere. We're beyond anything they can possibly imagine. Uh, they have no clue about how good it can be. That's where we are. How many of our people are prepared to fall as far as they fell or say fall to the level that they were at, falling that distance? and have the same level of hope and commitment that those people have. All right, where do we go from here? And where does this introductory class and the, this foundation level lead us? Well, there's kind of my printout of the pages and pages of classes. And we've done quite a number of those here and on Saturdays. And we'll be publishing them. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the this foundational area and you list down through these classes, this is where you go from here in this area. And if you look up there second from the top, you see foundation 1001. 
which is to survive to prepare, it was, it, which is to prepare to survive no matter what. This is kind of the section overview. See the classes that fall underneath that. We will be doing them here and in other venues in the future. Preparedness is a lifestyle. And a lifestyle that I simply call provident living. Living providently means that you're doing these things. You, you see, being prepared isn't about buying a bunch of stuff and shoving it in the trunk of the car, putting it in an emergency with or stacking it up in the closet or burying it in shelter in the ground. That's not what provident living is about. It's about it being part of your lifestyle. In other words, you're living and doing these things every day. It's about developing the attitudes every day as well as the skills and about setting things aside. So you're trying things, you're testing them, you're playing with them. I like to use the word play to have fun with it. Play with a lot of this stuff and I do it as an experiment because I'm curious. Sometimes they don't work out very well. I laugh at it and say like, well, I know what not to do, and you go on and you try something else. It is gaining this experience because of the experimenting that you're doing. It is something that you live and do and practice. If you want to learn how to fix something, don't buy a book, go fix something. And go fix it wrong. And then find out how to fix it right. Uh, it's all these kinds of things. But you do it for all the positive reasons. And so you go and do some strange things. Uh, and you know, I, I do things periodically. and. And you'll learn about some of these things and here my wife says, you know, that's way too much information you're telling them, <clears throat> but I experiment with things. At one time it's like, well, what if I couldn't cut my hair and I couldn't shave again? What's it like? I mean, is anything... And so I let my hair grow for, you know, I was close to a year and I didn't shave for about a year. Uh, I go out and I play in the deserts and the Arctic and mountaintops and with the grandkids and myself and try things. Some of them are unpleasant for a short period of time. And then I learn how to make them pleasant and I focus in that direction. Well, this is the conclusion of this foundation course, 1001, which is prepare to survive no matter what. And it literally is about developing that most important survival tool, which is you, who you are, what's inside of you. And I encourage you to, to learn and keep learning more and more about these things. As always, the ball is in your court and we are here doing everything that we can do to help you. Uh, the Tuesday night program that I do, tune into it through our website. I have wonderful people that we interview on there. They know things I don't know. That's why I bring them on so I can learn. Instead of me teaching a class, I get to learn from somebody else. We are here every Wednesday night. You can come to Cabela's and Lehigh and attend live, or you can attend online. We have a newsletter that will let you know about other classes and courses, and then most every Saturday, there will be a class going on uh, in our uh, outlet in Linden, and I do classes in other venues also. So join us. We'll take a little bit of extra time for both Q&A uh, as well as uh, product review and some things like that. For so, And then I'm going to go through some of the product review, in particular some of those books. We'll talk about talk about them in greater depth also when we do the library section, but I want to get people started here. So any question that you have from our audience here or anybody in our digital audience out there, and if not, I'll go into some of these thoughts. Okay, they're not asleep, just don't have any questions. Uh, now you can, any time along the way, also feel free to ask a question on anything. And I want to share with you a little bit on this product review that's related to these classes. <clears throat> One of them is this. I know that a lot of people have this. If you don't have it, I would encourage you to get it through the website. It's the Foundation Principles class that's on DVD. And we sell this at a very low cost because I want people to have it. And it'll go in greater depth over some of these principles. And there's a bunch of things in there that there was not time to talk about it tonight. It's a two-hour principle-based DVD that you can get. Now. If the only thing I got you to do after taking this class is buy the three books that I'm next going to talk about, I'd consider myself a success because these are so critically important in developing your attitude. These are my three attitude books that we looked at before. I'll look at them a little more closely here. My number one attitude book, Developing an Attitude, Learning What an Attitude is All About to Make It No Matter What. The foundation book for that is Deep Survival by Lawrence Gonzalez. I consider this to be the textbook. Now, as I've told some of you that have been to other classes, when I first saw that book, it was on a, I was up in Salt Lake City in a bookstore, and I like to go in bookstores. My wife was looking for something, and so I went off in sections. And when I move into, you know, it's the personal improvement, and sometimes you find survival books and things.
things like that. Some of them are stories of people's lives. And I came across this one I'd never seen before on the shelf. It said Deep Survival. Curious title. Took it off the shelf, took one look at the picture, put it back on the shelf, said, eh. Because my immediate impression was, okay, another gee whiz mom, look what I can do hanging from a rope on the side of a mountain, and I'm a hero, and yes, they did amputate my fingers and toes. I've read a lot of those, and they don't impress me too much. Um, and so I put it back on the shelf, but I came back around to it because I was looking and I didn't find anything else. I was pulled off the shelf again, put it back. I must have done that a half a dozen times or more. And finally I read these lines down below because this is the textbook for who lives, who dies, and why. That's why I bought the book. And now I promote it all the time. We've done a book review on it here, talked about it in depth, and had participation with our students in our other classes, and I would encourage you, please, get this book. As a matter of fact, when we talk about this book and these three books, I want you to read them in the order give them to you. They will have the greatest impact. They'll have the deepest meaning to get the most understanding out of them. So read Deep Survival. As a matter of fact, read it several times. This is how I read books when I want to study them. I just read it. I'll read it pretty much as quick as I can. Then I will go back and read it again with a highlighter in hand or an underliner, pen, whatever you want. And now that I start underlining things, I'll come to passage. I remember that really caught my attention. I highlight, I highlight, I highlight. Uh, go through the book. Uh, make marginal notes and things like that. Then come back the next time you read it. Just read what you, what you underlined or what you highlighted. Read your notes. Don't read all the rest of it so you can get through it quickly. Usually what that does is it brings up other memories and causes you to read other things around it. I would also encourage you to get the audio tapes of this, the CD of them because you'll learn differently when you're listening to somebody else read the book than when you're reading the book. Uh, and do it both ways. It's an important book to have and to study. I've read the book three, four times now, and I've listened to it about three times also uh, on uh, the cassette, and I'll listen to it periodically. My number two attitude book for Provident Living is this one, Miracle in the Andes. And here we find people in an impossible situation. This plane crashed in the Andes. Many people are familiar with this. This was in late in the year in 1972 when the rugby team crashed in the mountains in the Andes. Uh, and you may have read the book Alive, which came out in 1973. I read it as soon as it came out. Fascinating book. What an account. What an impossible situation. Uh, Alive does not count for this book. And the movie Alive is absolutely worthless. You know, it should have never been produced. Miracle in the Andes is what you want. Now, if you read it alive, you'll kind of know what the storyline is. This one's going to teach you a great deal more. Because what this is, this is truly a real-world case study of everything that Lawrence Gonzalez teaches in Deep Survival. And Deep Survival is full of many, many incidents in there, looking at life experiences with people that are very, very illustrated. One of the things I enjoy about Deep Survival. Uh, this will teach you about attitudes. Absolutely, it's laced with attitude. It will teach you about leadership, which is critically important. It will teach you about commitment, which was what it was all about for those who survived that did survive. And it will absolutely help you understand what I mean by the be attitudes, purpose, passion, integrity, courage, discipline, patience, and forgiveness you will get those things out of the book. Now, they, he doesn't use those words in there. They're not expressed in that way, but if you've read Deep Survival, you've listened to what I've said here, you read that book, you will understand what I'm talking about there. My third attitude book for Provident Living is this. It's called The Raft. Now, the green one there on the left, that's my original copy. I read it probably about 1959. <clears throat> and it was, to me, at then it was just like, what an adventure. Wow, this was tough. That was an impossible situation. What a miracle they survived. Well, this book is extremely important because one of the things it'll do is it will help you decide uh, about making it. You see, at one point in there, a, these guys came to a point where they decided that it would it, be a heck of a lot easier to die than it was to live. And you'll read stories of people in life that it's like, it is easier to die. Living can be an absolute pain, literally difficult. Uh, but you have to understand why it is that people made it through impossible situations. That's what this is about. But one of the things that's unique about this book 
is when I tell people that it's, it's your attitude, it's what's in your head, it's what's at your fingertips in terms of what you can do. It's not about what you own. This is the book about not having much. When these three airmen went down in the Pacific in February 1942, right at the end of World War, or the beginning of World War II, and they got into that little rubber raft, hence the name of the raft, three guys in this tiny little raft that's not much bigger than a bathtub, they didn't have much at all. They had very, very little, very poorly, shamelessly, poorly, uh, shamefully poorly uh, outfitted in that raft. And they floated around out there for more than a month in there. And, but when they get to the end of this adventure, uh, this was the total of what they owned. Every physical thing they had. There were three men, three bodies, one raft and one whistle on a chain. That's all that they had. They were naked. They had nothing. And yet they survived. You need to understand why. You also need to understand why when they came to that point when they said, it's easier to slip over time we're flipped out of this thing in a storm. Let's don't climb back into the raft because it takes them hours to drag themselves back into this raft. Struggle will be a few seconds and then we won't hurt. Why didn't they do that? You may find yourself in a situation where you're facing that decision. This may help you survive the impossible because if they had slipped over the side and let go, we wouldn't have this marvelous story of a Well, those are my three books. And by the way, there's other great attitude books out there to help you learn from. Other resources we might talk about very briefly. Endurance by Alfred Lansing, wonderful book. This is about Shackleton's voyage and get bringing a whole of his men back. There's an impossible situation. This is amazing. It's extraordinary. That's about attitude. That's about all of the beatitudes that are listed there. Another one, many people are familiar with this classic Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Another impossible situation where many people did not. Some that survived in the worst of the situation and there were some who had better situations, they didn't make it. And he was writing a difference. Why did some make it and others didn't make it? Uh, another one, and this is a course that I'll be re-releasing here, it's called Surviving Against All Odds. Uh, it comes with a workbook and the audio tapes and some training materials. You'll see that one coming out in the future. So this is part of a attitude library. I believe those first three books up there, Deep Survival, Miracle in the End, Raft are the most important ones. Two key strategy books, and there's a number of strategy books. One of them is One Second After. Uh, this is an extremely important book, and I would encourage everybody to read it. It is, in fact, a gnarly book. It is, in fact, based on this report, which is the report by the Commission to assess the threat to the United States from electromagnetic pulse attack. Uh, and it's quite an interesting report with some of the things that it says in there. There's no lightweights in this one. All of these individuals were leaders in their field. They were part of this commission that's based on good science, both physical science and also uh, on the science of, if you will, humanity and cultures and those types of things. Um, the report is unusual because some of its terminology using things like devastating and lismic, those are not usually used in government reports. And one of the other things that they came to the conclusion is, should we have a very successful worst case scenario EMP attack, that the first year die off of the population in the U.S. would be 80 percent. Not 80 percent live, 80 percent die. It would be due to violence, starvation, and disease. Now one second after, what it does, it puts a human face on that. It, it gives you the, the gut-wrenching emotions of things. Uh, it's very important to read it. Uh, because it is, first off, based very carefully on this commission report. It's written in a novel form so that you can kind of get your head around the social and the personal impact of these things, uh, rather than it's not a book that's going to teach you how to deal with EMP. It is this story of this impact, and it's very well written. Uh, and what it's really written to is to help people understand what the price would be to a country to a community that would allow this to happen because they were not prepared. The idea being we can prevent this by being prepared. <clears throat> and also the other thing that's unique about this book, this author takes on some very difficult questions that I haven't seen other authors address. Things that I've raised questions about and I didn't have good answers for because I really didn't know how to handle them. He addresses them in there very thoughtfully but very chilling. Uh, uh, in there. By the way, there's other books on EMP out there.
The second strategy book is When Technology Fails. And this author, uh, Matthew Stein, I've had him on our radio program twice now talking about Look at this as a strategy book in particular when he's talking about the risks that we have. You need to understand them, the reality of them. Are all of them going to occur? Probably not. Hope not. Could some of them occur? Probably. More than likely they will. <clears throat> there are other uh, strategy books that you can look at besides these two. They would include a couple of classics. The book Earth Abides, which was written in 1947, is basically about pandemic, global pandemic. Alas, Babylon is about thermal nuclear exchange. It was written in 59, uh, and it's not likely that we're going to have that occur, yet limited strike is probably a pretty high probability someplace in the world. And then a more recent DVD was a video that was on the History Channel called After Armageddon. Now, I'll tell you, in all of these books, they're not 100% correct or in this video, and this video has some technical problems in it in terms of a couple of things they show in there. It's like, boy, that's baloney. That's wrong, uh, what they show in there. But that doesn't mean that the whole thing is bad. I think it's very good because in a very short order, it'll help you get your head around some of the emotions of how bad it could be because you need to understand we don't act on what we know. We act on what we feel about what we know. And so part of it in these books, in One Second After, uh, in After Armageddon, is to help you get a feeling about these things so that you would perhaps make a choice to do something. There's part of the strategy library. And in coming classes, when we go into the library, we'll dig into more in depth. Well, I know on EMP protection for radios and things, and that's why I did the class that I did. And I have one primary answer to still get, and then I'll come back and finish the thing. Building. And the truth is about most of what you'll find on EMP on the Internet and how to protect things and the little videos and what have you is absolutely baloney. It will not work. It, it'll do between nothing to not enough. And not enough is just as bad as nothing is what it comes down to. It is dependent somewhat on how severe the attack is should it occur. Um, and where you are in relationship to it. But you have to prepare for the worst. Remember the idea is if you're prepared for the worst, you're going to be okay. And so I look at it from worst case scenario because I want to be prepared for the worst. If you're halfway prepared for half an event and three quarters of the event or 100% of it occurs, then you know what was you wasted time and money. So you might as well prepare all the way or forget it is what it comes down to. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do the best you can do with what you have right now, because you do, in fact, do that as long as you know eh, this probably may not take care of it in a worst-case scenario. Uh, so we'll talk more about the shielding on that. But for those that haven't been here before, uh, one of the problems with putting things into the ammo cans and into the number 10 cans, wrapping them in aluminum foil, all these things, putting them in the microwave, they're just not effective. But one of the things that people miss that I didn't understand completely in the beginning, I knew there was some limit and why I wasn't comfortable with what I was seeing. That is the fact that the, uh, the, the material depth, the steel or aluminum, is not thick enough. Uh, very often it's stated all you have to have is a Faraday cage and it can be very, very thin. That's true for radio waves. That's true for a lot of things. It's not true for EMP. EMP is quite an interesting animal. It's very, very different than shielding from an FM radio station or shielding from just radar, a single frequency. It's easy to shield against radar. I was in the radar business in the Navy. I was fixing high-powered radar. I did that and worked with wave guard guides and all these things. And I thought, I see, I tried to apply my original understanding, which is what most people do, and say, well, radar and EMP, same thing. Not even close. They are so far related that you might as well consider them and they are, as a matter of fact. And that's one of the problems. It's about the energy of the pulse, how far, how quick it raises, and the fact that it can pass through an amazing wall thickness needs to be at least 90 mil. Uh, 55 gallon drums run around 60. So there are some questions I have yet to answer. We know what will do the shielding. Absolutely, but it's a little bit difficult to pull off with the underground questions to get answered, and then I'll be ready. When we do the EMP class again, I'll have the shield. But putting them in number 10 cans, wrapping them in aluminum foil, 
face blankets, uh, putting them in um, just as wire cages, typical Faraday cages, will not take out all of the frequencies. It'll take out some of them, but it won't take out enough of them, so you still fry stuff. A little harder to protect than most people believe that it is, and the little shows on the internet are going to leave you to believe. Put it in your metal shin, uh, shed and put down a, a ground rod and tie it to it. You know, that's lightning protection. Have diddly to do with EMP protection. It'll protect it from a lightning strike, but it won't help. Yeah, that's that's one of those that's a pretty nasty little thing to get. Any other questions anybody has in our live audience or on uh, line here? I don't see anything online. Well, thank you very much. Have yourself a great evening, and uh, we will see you in coming days. Good night. This is Jim Phillips with